Utah Senator Mitt Romney asked U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken if Israel is losing the PR war. Here's a snippet of their conversation, which took place at the McCain Institute. Let's watch. Why has Hamas disappeared in terms of public perception? An offer is on the table to have a ceasefire, and yet the world is screaming about Israel. It's like, why aren't that screaming about Hamas? Accept the ceasefire, bring home the, the hostages. It said it's all the other way around. I, 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 I've, I mean, typically, the Israelis are good at PR. What's happened here? How have, hmm. they, how have they and we been so ineffective at communicating um, the, the realities there and our, our point of view? Well, look, I think there are two things. Um, one is that, look, there is an inescapable reality, uh, and that is the inescapable reality of uh, people who have, uh, have and continue to suffer grievously in Gaza. And that's real, and we have to, have to be focused on that and attend to that. At the same time, um, how this narrative has evolved yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't have a good answer to that. Um, there, one can speculate about what some of the, the causes might be. Uh, I don't know. I can tell you this. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit over dinner. Uh, with Cindy, I think in my time in Washington, which is a little bit, a little bit over 30 years, um, the single biggest change uh, has been in the information environment. And when I started out in the early 1990s, uh, everyone did the same thing. Uh, you woke up in the morning, you opened the door of your apartment, uh, your house, you picked up a hard copy of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. And then if you had a television in your office, um, you turned it on at 6.30 uh, or 7 o'clock and watched the National Network News. Now, of course, we are on a, an intravenous feed of information uh, with um, new impulses, inputs every millisecond. And, of course, the way this has played out on social media has dominated the, uh, the narrative. And you have a social media ecosystem environment in which context, history, facts get lost, and the emotion, the impact of images um, dominates. And we can't, we can't discount that. Um, but I think it also uh, has a very, very, very challenging effect on on, on the narrative. Yeah, a small parenthetical point, which is some wonder why there was such overwhelming support uh, for us to shut down potentially TikTok or other entities of that nature. If you look at the, uh, the postings on TikTok and the number of mentions of Palestinians relative to other social media sites, it's overwhelmingly so among uh, TikTok um, uh, uh, broadcasts. Blinken's comments come as talks for a ceasefire in Gaza have come to a grinding halt. And so it's interesting for me to hear Mitt Romney say, you know, it's very simple. Hamas, you should just, you know, free the hostages and then the war would end and we'd have a ceasefire. That is what was on the table in Egypt. That is what Hamas agreed to during the ceasefire talks. And that's what Benjamin Netanyahu ruled out, not what Hamas ruled out. Hamas was totally fine with this exchange of the war would end if we would free the hostages. And Benjamin Netanyahu ruling that out, and now Hamas is getting blamed for it? That's a ridiculous statement to make if you're Mitt Romney. And having, you know, Anthony Blinken say that this is because TikTok is a fast and furious social media app, really, you, you can't blame TikTok. They're trying to make it seem like Chinese propaganda has created this pro-Palestine sentiment in the U.S. No. Israel's actions have created a pro-Palestine sentiment in the U.S. What people are seeing on TikTok is what is not played on cable news and in mainstream media by the United States, which is day in and day out a firsthand account of the destruction in Gaza. And so to have them running cover for Benjamin Netanyahu being the one who destroyed the, the current session of ceasefire talks by not agreeing to this exchange and also blaming TikTok for pro-Palestine sentiment, not Israel's action that the U.S. is complicit with. It's just uh, laughable at this point to hear our leaders talking about, you know, things that they're saying as if they're well understood facts that just simply aren't by, you know, this is reported by Reuters. It's reported by BBC. It's reported by Al Jazeera. It's not like this is something that's contested. And they're talking about it as if it never happened and it's all Hamas's fault. Well, I agree with some of what you said and disagree with other parts of it. I, I mean, it is Hamas's fault. Hamas is a, 
authoritarian terrorist organization that attacked Israel, and they're rejecting any peace that doesn't include Hamas's surrender, and they're willing to continue the war until Hamas is destroyed or surrenders because Israel thinks it will suffer further attacks from this terrorist group if their elimination is not part of the deal. They're, they're not they're not interested in a long-term ceasefire because they don't think Hamas is being honest about wanting a long-term ceasefire. In fact, a Hamas spokesperson has said that there will be many, many, many attacks like what happened on October 7th, that that will happen over and over and over again. Um, and so they have taken the position that the a, a ceasefire, a long-term peace, um, includes the end of Hamas. Hamas is not willing to do that, so Israel is willing to continue the conflict. In terms of where public sentiment is, um, I'm not sure. That, I mean, I think the public is obviously watching the images out of Gaza and thinking that it is horrifying, that this, the number, the casualties, the number of people who are dying, um, women and children, innocent people. Um, I, I think the, the, the humanitarian crisis is well understood. Um, I, I don't know. And, and the American people, again, they, they support, I think, they, they want there to be peace. They want there to be a ceasefire. But what does that actually entail? I, I've seen polling that shows when you ask people, um, well, if there's a ceasefire but it leaves Hamas in power to you know, wage further atrocities against Israel, is that the kind of ceasefire you want? And then public opinion turns against it. Public opinion on the protesters, many people think it should have been even more um, that the police didn't do enough to shut down the protesters. So I, I, I certainly think among very young people, maybe people who are most active on TikTok, um, they're far more uh, pro-Palestinian than the rest of um, the rest of the country, I don't think that's, and like you, I don't think that's specifically because of the platform. I don't think that's because China is like, you know, manipulating what you're trying to see. I, I think it's because the sentiment is genuine among young people and that public officials like Romney and Blinken have to grapple with the fact that these policies are not popular among young people. Now, whether that should affect policy is another question. Whether their votes, whether their opinions are to be taken seriously is, a, I guess, a problem for Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. Um, in fact, I think Joe Biden could probably make himself more popular by, um, by, by pivoting even further in the other direction or being more dismissive of what young left people want. But, uh, and I, I take as evidence of that John Fetterman's increasing popularity by being the most pro-Israel Democrat of all, routinely calling out Hamas. Um, he's made himself more popular, not less. No, I think the people under, or 44 and under, are not very young people. I think. Yeah, you know, those are people that have a pretty solid worldview. They're not getting all of their news on TikTok. And having only 16% of that age group saying that they believe that the response to protesters was too harsh, I think that's very telling. I think the like majority of people believe in the right to protest and remember the Vietnam War protests enough and the responses to those protests. We learn about these in history classes. And this was students standing up and saying the United States is complicit in denying South Vietnam from the right to self-determination. And that's really what Israel wants here. They want to control who is in power in Palestine. They want to control Palestinian land. They've had occupations ongoing for many, many years. And there was a point in time where we did have an agreement for a, a two-state solution. And then you had, you know, the leader of Israel assassinated by the right wing coalition in Israel. Now we have a right wing leader in Israel and a right wing government in Israel making decisions that many Israelis disagree with, that many Jewish people around the globe disagree with. And Benjamin Netanyahu has said that there cannot be a Palestinian government post war in Gaza, that actually it needs to be controlled by Israel. And now the United States has said, well, we disagree with that. Of course, that's ridiculous. But that, of course, is at play in these peace talks here. He's been very explicit that, you know, he doesn't want there to be a Palestinian state post-war operating in the Gaza Strip. What are we supposed to do in that position? You are denying the Palestinians the right to self-determination. So in that sense, the students across the U.S. protesting it is very similar to the Vietnam War. And the response to these protesters that Columbia University has said, you know, we really don't you know, approve of how we reacted. We regret how the university responded to the Vietnam War protests. And then they're repeating history again. And I think a lot of people who are older, who are watching exchanges between Antony Blinken and Mitt Romney, and they hear Mitt Romney say, you know, Hamas, this could all be over if you would just agree to free the hostages and end the war. He didn't say anything about 
well, eradicating Hamas is necessary. He said, agree to free the hostages and end the war. That is what Hamas agreed to, but it's not what Netanyahu agreed to. So are people's perceptions of the war, of Hamas, of why it's still ongoing, based on truth or based on what Mitt Romney and Antony Blinken are okay saying into a camera, which is not the truth about the ceasefire negotiations. And so it really depends on where people are getting their information. But I do think we're at a point where, you know, the U.S. government's going and, you know, the Biden administration more specifically is going to have to address the public with the facts of what's going on, because we're losing trust in our government when, you know, what the Secretary of State and Mitt Romney are saying is different from what's being reported by the biggest news sources in the world. I mean, but the issue is, I mean, Hamas doesn't recognize Israel's right to exist. The, you're right, the Israeli government does not recognize Hamas's right to govern the, Pal the Gaza Strip, to govern Palestinian territory, and that's why our, we're a war. I think, I, I absolutely support a two-state solution. I think the Palestinians should have um, should have self-governance. They're actually denied self-governance by Hamas. They haven't, you know, had a vote on who their leadership is going to be in the 20 years. Most of the people still alive there had no say in who is going to, to rule them. Um, so it, while a two-state solution is appealing to those of us in the U.S., the actual participants in this conflict have no interest in that. They want to fight and they want to destroy each other, and so that's what they're doing. So I, I wish they would stop, and I wish they would, you know, just live in peace, but that's just, like, my na a naive hope of us in the West, I feel like, when no one involved in the conflict actually wants Wants that and they're willing to have the violence and they're willing to produce the carnage um, that we're seeing and there's just there's very little that we can do about it now of course I agree with you that we should put pressure on Joe Biden or whoever else would be in the White House I don't support our tax dollars being deployed in another region of the world civil war and I think the US should disengage from the conflict and from all of these conflicts in the Middle East to the greatest extent possible um, I think it does inspire terrorism and blowback against the US I don't think um, other countries have a right to U.S. taxpayers' dollars. I don't think their security is more important than ours. I don't think it's enhancing our security. So I'm absolutely with you, and I'm frankly with young people who are looking pretty skeptically at that aspect of American foreign policy. I think being less involved rather than more would be a good idea. If they want to, you know, if, they, if that region of the world, everybody there wants to fight it out, that's their problem, and we should. It, we're not making the situation worse. Or we're not, I mean, not making the situation better by being more involved, and we're maybe making our own situation worse. I think that's absolutely true. I think we wouldn't have seen the destruction we've seen in Gaza without American support, American weapons, and that's a really tough thing for this administration to grapple with. That there's 30,000 people dead most of them women and children. And so we're at this point where it, it doesn't seem like the war is explicitly to eradicate Hamas with the amount of death and destruction we've seen. You can be more precise in taking out military targets. We haven't seen that. And it does seem to be a continuation of Israel's policy that a lot of them have been pretty open about since October 7th, saying there are no innocents in Gaza. And we've had this conversation time and again about collective punishment, about punishing all of the civilians in Gaza for the statements and the view of Hamas when they haven't had elections, when elections have been postponed. And yes, they do say it's, it's because of Israel. We believe that they're deeply involved, they're meddling, they're preventing us from having free and fair elections. A lot of people say this is Hamas's excuse because they're afraid they're going to lose. In any case, Israel has denied their ability to have elections in the past, to have a military. Hillary Clinton has been caught on you know audio saying that we need to figure out a way to make sure the people we like win in the elections in Palestine. So I I can only imagine what it feels like to be a Palestinian and to want you know democratic leadership and to hear Hillary Clinton say this knowing you know the CIA and the American foreign policy establishment has cooed any leader they want to in the past and has been able to do so in ways where it's not obvious that there's direct U.S. involvement. And so having fear around having an election after people like Hillary Clinton have made these claims, I totally understand why. If I was a Palestinian and I was pro-democracy and I wanted a, a Palestinian state, why I would be afraid to hold elections in that political climate? But being denied having your own military is, is key in, in having self-determination. You can't if you can't defend yourself. And so Israel has weapons from the richest country in the world, the strongest military in the world, and you know our, our undying support, no matter what kind of crazy right winger is in office, we're saying we support Israel no matter what. That's an insane political position with the destruction we've seen. And so I think we're at a point where we have to really reckon with, are they er eradicating Hamas? 
or are they actualizing their plan of not wanting a Palestinian state at all, which is what Benjamin Netanyahu has wanted. And so I think it's time for the U.S. to realize that and pull out because the words don't match the actions if that's really, you know, what they're saying behind closed doors to the State Department. It, those conversations could look very different from what we're seeing in the, in the press and in the media. Mm. More rising right after this.